Chapter 8. I dropped flat onto my stomach and covered my head. I felt a strong whoosh of wind as the huge bird creature swooped over us. Twisting my neck, I glanced up. There were two of them, enormous birds, flapping noisily above Elliot and me, preparing to dive again. Get flat! Get flat! Elliot cried in a hoarse whisper. What are they? I cried. They're buzzard hawks. Huh? They're so huge. They... Get flat, he ordered, as flat as you can. Why? I demanded. Because they're blind. I heard them squawking angrily above us. Their shadows rolled over us again. Buzzard hawks are blind? They can't see, but they can smell you, Elliot whispered. They can smell fear. We both were spread out on our stomachs. I buried my face in the grass. I held my breath as I heard the enormous creatures swoop down on us again. Oh, I couldn't help it. I let out a moan as I felt sharp talons scrape down the back of my shirt. Pain shot through my whole body. I started to curl into a ball. Don't move, Elliot warned. I felt his hand on my shoulder. They haven't smelled us down here yet. If they did, he didn't finish. The birds made another dive. I buried my face in the dirt and held my breath. Every muscle in my body tightened. Another whoosh of wind swept over me as the birds swooped inches over us. It took only a second or two, but it seemed like an hour. Frozen in fright, I didn't move. I felt the wind off their wings, then silence. After a long while, I slowly, carefully lifted my head. Yes, the buzzard hawks have flown away. I stood up, but my legs were so shaky I could barely balance myself. Close one, I said. Elliot nodded. His eyes were still wide with fright. They must have heard us when we were in the quagmire. Dangerous birds. Their claws are deadly. I mean, really. You mean they'd claw us? I asked. Claw us, then eat us, Elliot replied. They're meat eaters. I shuddered. Let's get out of here. I don't like this place. Elliot started to his bike. It's not bad if you keep alert. Keep alert, I shouted. How can you keep alert against fish that chew your jeans off and birds that can rip you to pieces? He didn't answer. He picked up his bike and climbed onto it. I'm in trouble, I murmured. I'm already in big trouble because of a thing I did to our neighbor, and now I've lost my bike, and no way Mom and Dad will believe me if I tell them it's at the bottom of a quagmire. But it's the truth, Elliot said. I could back up your story. They'll believe me. Maybe, I said. As I walked home, Elliot rode beside me, circling me, riding up a ways, then back. I didn't want to think about how we almost drowned in the quagmire. I didn't want to think about anything that happened there. So, I decided to count lawn gnomes as I walked. They were perched on every lawn, posted near driveways, leaning against tree trunks, ugly little bearded fellows in red outfits and those funny caps. Totally weird. I counted 32 of them, and I was still a few blocks from home. Most of them stared straight out to the street as if they were watching, watching us pass by with their big, blank, painted eyes. In my old neighborhood, no one had lawn gnomes, I told Elliot. We thought they were too ugly to put on front lawns. I don't get it. Really? Why are these stupid little men everywhere I look? He spun his bike around. I've got to go. This is my street, he pointed. Do you know the rest of the way? I nodded. Yeah, sure. Well, see you around, he said. Thanks for saving my life, he started to pedal away. Sorry about your bike, he called. Yeah, me too, I said. I watched him ride down the street. He turned into the driveway of the little yellow and white house at the end of the block. I turned and started walking slowly toward my house. The sun was nearly down. The sky was streaked with red. Lawn gnomes stared at me from front yards as I passed, but I didn't feel like counting anymore. I was worried about my lost bike. I'd promised my parents I'd be more responsible in our new neighborhood, and here I was coming home without my bike. I sighed. Maybe they won't notice, I told myself. I turned at my house and walked up the front lawn. To my surprise, two lawn gnomes stood on the front porch. Who moved them? I wondered. I climbed onto the porch, stepping past the ugly little gnomes, and started to open the front door. Jay, where's your bike? One of them demanded. Chapter 9. I gasped. I raised my eyes and saw my dad on the other side of the screen door. The lawn gnome didn't speak to me. Of course not. It was dad. Where's your bike? He repeated. Uh, well, it's a long story, I murmured. He held open the door and I slumped into the house. Did you lose it? He demanded. Kinda, I said. It's at the bottom of a quagmire. 
He squinted at me. He didn't look happy. I knew you wouldn't believe me, I said. Dad sighed. I don't know what to believe. I don't want to keep punishing you, but Jay, you promised. Dad, what's up with all the lawn gnomes? I asked. These two on the porch and in every yard and... You know, Dad said. Mom called from the kitchen. Hey, you two, supper's almost ready. Time to eat. Dad turned and strode to the kitchen. Coming, dear. I hurried upstairs to wash up. I could smell myself. I smelled like a swamp. I thought about sinking in that sandy orange goo, and it made me shudder. I wasn't sure I liked my new neighborhood. In two words, it was dangerous and creepy. Of course, I had no idea how creepy it really was. The next afternoon, I stayed in my room. Sunlight poured in through my window, and a warm breeze ruffled the curtains. But I didn't feel like going outside. I set up my test tubes and glass beakers on my lab table. Then I arranged my chemical bottles. I've always been a science freak. I love taking chemicals at random, mixing them together, and seeing the results. It's relaxing and exciting at the same time. I studied the brown glass bottles, trying to decide what kind of mixture to create. I poured a little bit of a bright orange chemical I made into a large beaker. Then I added just a drip of hydrogen peroxide. It made a soft hissing sound, and it smelled sharp and bitter. I stirred in a few teaspoons of magnesium, but it didn't seem to do anything at all. When my family moved here three weeks ago, my parents tried to stop me from bringing my chemistry set. I mean, we had to move because of all the trouble I caused with my chemicals. And all we wanted was a clean start. No one in our new town knew about what I had done. Mom and Dad wanted to make sure it never happened again. But my chemicals are just too important to me. How could I leave them behind? Working with chemicals and learning about science isn't just a hobby with me. It's what I care about more than anything in the world. Maybe someday I'll be a famous scientist and I'll create something totally terrific. I screamed and cried and begged and pleaded, but they said no. So I had no choice. I hid my chemistry set in a carton of blankets and sneaked it into the house. I raised a test tube of new acid I discovered and I tilted it into my mixing beaker. The acid made the liquid inside start to bubble and fizz. Hey, what's up? Kayla walked into the room. She startled me. I almost dropped the tube of acid. Don't you ever knock? She ignored my question and stepped up to the lab table. Ew, that stinks. What are you doing? I snickered. I'm mixing up a special drink from McClatchy. Kayla didn't laugh. Stop it, Jay. That's not funny. Stop thinking about pranks and mean tricks to play on people. I held out the fizzing beaker. Take a sip. See if it's ready. She stepped back. You're really being stupid. You know that? I didn't answer. I poured a little more acid in the beaker and watched it bubble. But Kayla wasn't finished scolding me. I can't believe you're mixing chemicals again. You promised Mom and Dad, she said. You promised them you've changed. You said you'd be responsible from now on. So? I shot back. So you got caught stuffing McClatchy's mailbox with garbage. And you lost your bike. That wasn't my fault, I said. Go ahead. Do something responsible, she said. Do something to impress Mom and Dad. I set the test tube back in its holder. Like what? Kayla thought for a moment. Go take Mr. Phineas on his afternoon walk. Do it before they ask you to do it. Good idea, I said. I'll do it. I started to close the lids on the chemical bottles. Kayla, do you want to come with me? She shook her head. Too boring. She turned and ran from the room. A few minutes later, I snapped the leash on Mr. Phineas and we set off walking down the front lawn. Mr. Phineas, stop pulling, I cried. Stop it. You're pulling the leash from my hand. The dog was pulling like crazy, excited to be outside, I guess. Mr. Phineas, stop. Mr. Phineas, slow down, boy. To my surprise, the two lawn gnomes had been moved from the front porch. Now they were at the bottom of the driveway. Across the street, McClatchy's two lawn gnomes stood at the curb. The four bearded gnomes appeared to be having a staring match. Who keeps moving them around, I wondered. And more important, why? What a mystery. So far, I couldn't get any answers to my questions, get anyone to answer my questions about them. More gnomes stared at us from front yards as Mr. Phineas pulled me down the street. At one house, I saw five of them standing in a circle. The gnomes' arms were outstretched. It looked like they were holding hands. Totally weird. Hey, stop! I let out a cry as Mr. Phineas took off. I saw a squirrel half a block away. No, stop, stop. The leash flew out of my hand. 
Barking his head off, the big dog went tearing down the middle of the street. The squirrel froze for a moment, then turned and scampered away. Mr. Phineas, come back! Come back! It's a panic. In a panic, I stumbled after him, shouting, begging him to stop his hunt. But nothing can stop Mr. Phineas when he spots a squirrel. Mr. Phineas, stop! Come back! The leash whipped along the pavement behind him as he ran. I didn't see the squirrel anywhere. It had probably climbed a tree, but the dog didn't slow down. Mr. Phineas, please! And then I saw a dark green car turn onto the street, and I staggered to a stop, my body frozen in horror. No! No! Mr. Phineas, look out! I shut my eyes and listened to the squeal of tires.